All right, so like I was saying, we are in chapter 6 this morning, which is Confession Brings Freedom. And uh, this morning I was talking a little bit with Phil, and uh, unlike other chapters, this chapter has a lot of information. It's very information-based. There's a lot of uh, techniques, principles, and just good... um, Good examples, I guess, or not really examples, but just good uh, information that hopefully we can learn about and um, understand it and try to overcome some of uh, the falls that this chapter has presented. Uh, The key verse for this chapter comes from Proverbs 28, 13, which says, He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, will find mercy. Um, The title of the lesson, again, is Confession Brings Sins, or, yeah, Confession Brings Freedom from Sins. Um, So, the first verse that I wanted to uh, look at comes from John 3.16. We all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting Life And this verse is key, obviously, as a Christian, but also as a peacemaker. Uh, we see here that, you know, God's grace and his love uh, for us is prominent because he sent his son for us. And as we try to understand his grace, uh, as we are uh, peacemakers ourselves... We want to we try to focus on stripping away our selfishness and pride, kind of you know, what Jesus did, right, whenever he came to earth and died for us. But also, we can understand just how important reconciliation is to God. Uh, and th- understanding these two aspects from this verse and from all, all sorts of verses we can understand how to be a better peacemaker. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, that should be a little bit further apart, spaced apart. But the author goes into this chapter with four different, I guess, principles. The first being repentance. The second being self-examination. The third being confession. And then the fourth uh, and final being personal change. So this first uh, basic principle or... This first, uh, I guess, process in understanding uh, restoration is repentance. And we know that when we repent, it is more than just a feeling. So I wanted to ask the class, what does true repentance look like as a Christian or as a peacemaker? I guess... Repentance can be, it's a gift, right? Repentance is a gift from God. Uh, Repentance ultimately frees us from sin that we've committed. Uh, It literally means to change the way that we think. Uh, We we hear to turn away, to do a whole 180. Uh Uh-oh, that's not, okay, never mind. Um, To do a whole 180, right? We see in Luke 15, verse 17, Uh, Where we learn about the prodigal son, uh, Jesus talks about how the the lost son, after he was pretty much at the lowest of lows, he was eating the same meals that the pigs were even eating, that he, what what Jesus says, he came to his senses, uh, which is another kind of uh, definition of repentance. It's where we will finally come to our senses and in 2 Timothy 2, 25 through 26, uh, Paul writes, or excuse me, yeah, Paul writes, correcting his opponents with gentleness, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses. Again, we see coming to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to his will. So, so for us... To truly repent, we need to realize that we are deceiving ourselves, and really we're deceiving God ultimately, and we need to do our best to turn back to God. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, 
uh, Paul writes again to the Corinthians, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So we see here that hopefully... As we are trying to go down the path of complete repentance, full repentance, there's two different types of sorrow that uh, repentance can bring to somebody, right? So the first being worldly sorrow. And this worldly sorrow is what we want to try to avoid. So basically, it's the type of sorrow uh, where, you know, we get caught up in a sin and then we get caught in that sin, and we might be sorry for a time, but after a while, that sorrow kind of goes away, and then we end up uh, being caught back in that same sin. So really, we want, and, and then Paul describes it as um, the sorrow of the world which produces death. So we obviously want to try to avoid this worldly sorrow, but instead, we want to try to have godly sorrow. And this is where if we truly find God, uh, if we truly want to find godly repentance, uh, we will have a change of heart. We will understand that we've offended God, that we've offended other people, but ultimately that we've offended God, and that you know, for us to want to not offend God, um, we will understand how to truly repent. So, is there any other comments? Yes, Pam. Definitely. Definitely. So you're, I mean, that's a good point. So even though we can repent, and we're actually going to touch on this, and we're going to touch on David a little bit as well, uh, and that exact story, but even though we, are gonna re we, we, try to do, we try to do our best to repent, we still are going to have consequences. We're still going to have to face those consequences. And we actually read about that a little bit in this book. So thank you for that. Is there any other comments? Yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yes, it's I that that I should change that. It, it's definitely not just a thought process, right? I mean, we want to be able to change our mind totally uh, from wrongdoings and from sin, but really, we want to act the way that we've changed. Very good point. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. And you're the winner because this is our next point. <laughs> it's like she read the book or something. So that's exactly right. Right? We're not going to be able to understand true repentance until we understand ourselves. And really at the same time until we read the Bible and understand what God wants us to do to understand what we're not what we're not following through with. Um, thank you for that. Is any other comments before we go into, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so obviously once we've definitely put on this godly sorrow and we've turned away, we can have all those characteristics. Hopefully we can have all those characteristics as we pursue uh, to be better Christians. Good comments. Is there anything else? So moving to what Terry was um, alluding to, self Self-examination. So the next, uh, the next, I guess, the next 
item in the process of restoration is self-examination. And for us to truly understand what we're examining, right, in, in, this, in this process, we kind of have to understand the basic, and we all know what a sin is, but what is a sin? And the book has it as we've missed the mark, so, um, when we've missed the mark, when we fail to do what God has commanded us and we actually do things that God actually forbids us to do, um, and where we, I guess, literally and just we rebel against God. We do the things that he asks us and tells us, commands us to not do. Uh, and how easy, and I guess I should say that um, as humans, right, as humans, we tend to tuck our sins away, right? We know that some sins are big, but there's also smaller sins that we've committed that God hates, right? Telling little white lies or, you know, doing something in our car that maybe we shouldn't do, something that nobody else sees, those are still sins and those are still wrong in God's eyes. And so I wanted to ask is, how easy is it, us, is it for us to conceal these sins and conceal these wrongdoings that, as big or as small as they are, are they, are they I mean, is it easy? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, honestly, we will only know if we're sinning is if we actually are studying our Bible, right? I mean, we have to continuously study and pray and meditate on the things that God teaches us to understand, you know, what are we missing? What do we need to confess to God and, and repent from? Yes. Hopefully, yeah. Definitely. Exactly. Yeah, that, exactly right. And that's what the church is for as well, right? We come to church and, and hopefully while we're, you know, worshiping with, with the saints and while the Spirit is in us, we can, you know, reflect on what we've done and try to repent and, and truly repent from those. Yes, Terry. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very, yeah. God knows all. Yes. Ah, sorry.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have to have faith, right? And understand, well, I guess attempt to understand God's grace in, in that. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course. And that's why we're here, right? Man. Yeah, no, very good point, and that's an excellent uh, thought for all of us, right? Yes, Bill. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good point. Good point. He didn't dwell on it. I don't. I'm. Yeah. I'm. I'm sure there was an inner. There might have been inner guilt, but at the same time, he understood that he had hope as well. I don't know. <laughs> Keith, I can't say that. <laughs> even, though we, even though we are human, and God knows that we're Yes. Definitely. And uh, I'm not sure if I touch, I was looking down at my notes, I'm not sure if I touch on this coming up or if I missed it, but yes, definitely a change of heart is really where this all begins. And, and where we should go from there. Great comments. Is there anything else? Very true, yes. He, he understands. Yes. He does. Sorry, Keith. I wasn't trying to put you down. No. <laughs> so as we move on, uh, James four seventeen, uh, talking more about sin. Therefore, to him who knows to do good. So this isn't just concealing uh, sins that we do, right? This is actually for for. And let me let me read the verse first. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it. To him, it is sin. So, at the same time as if we conceal our sins and hide them from God, even if we know what to do as a Christian, even if we know what good to do and we don't do it, we're sinning in God's eyes. Uh, I don't want to get into specifics or in detail with that because, you know, it's obviously, that is very deep, but is there any comments on, on, this, on this point? So, it, it, kind of applying this to actual conflict, right? So we have uh, a conflict with someone else. Just like if we know 
to do good and we don't do it, if we know that we have conflict with someone and we don't try to resolve it, then who's at blame? We are, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. It does, and we will learn more about that. So, yeah, Perry. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. So the book also talks about a 40-60 rule. Um, and again, as we attempt to restore peace from conflict, and as we attempt to try our best to uh, talk to other people, we kind of have to lay aside what the book calls is a 40-60 rule. I mean, you can look at it 70-30 or 100 to zero, right? Well, let me not say 100 to zero. 40, so we'll stay with 40-60. So, and this basic principle is, well, I only did 40% of the wrongdoing and that other person did 60, so really they should be the one uh, to ask for forgiveness. Is this right? Obviously not. Right, so if we have any sort of, I guess, um, obligation to res resolve a conflict, or if we've done any part in a conflict, whether it's 40, 30, I wouldn't say zero, then, then obviously it's not on us, but any sort of, of a percentage, um, we need to do our best to try to restore and uh, seek out peace in that conflict. In 1 John um, 1, 8, John writes, if we say we have no sin, we deceive others, and the truth is not in us. So, kind of going back to what Pam said earlier, we can, we can definitely take accounts, and I think Phil might have touched on this, we can definitely take in uh, um, stories of the Old Testament, right? We can try to apply these stories to our own life, such as David. David did wrong uh, when he murdered Uriah, and um, basically took Bathsheba for himself. And from that story, we learn that Nathaniel had to go to, to David and, and basically teach him what he did wrong. And then from there, David lamented and he was sorry. And, and he did a lot of different things to pursue repentance. Before we get to that point, before we even have to have somebody else tell us what we've done wrong, hopefully we can understand this story and apply it to our lives too. If we do something wrong, even if it's minimal, uh, we should do our best to try to seek out restoration and reconciliation. And if we do need help and guidance from others, from say uh, a brother here or an elder or somebody to help us with this conflict, then again, the story of David is a perfect example because that's just what he did, right? He, he had guidance, even though he may not have willingly asked for it. Uh, he had guidance from someone else to kind of lead him through to repentance. Um, I guess before we move on, are there any last comments on this part of self-examination? All right. <laughs> yeah, Of course. Yeah, and, and this book actually does a really good job of, of what you're um, what you're saying. If and, and really it also touches on points of, you know, asking the other person 
to kind of help you understand what you've done wrong. Maybe you don't think, or maybe you think you've only done 1%, right? Trying to ask the other person and, and you know, get their side of the story is always helpful. I mean, obviously, when we're in conflict, getting the other side tends to hurt, but it's how we handle it. And as we read this book and kind of use these tools the way that the author is trying to present to us, then we should be able to uh, find out what we've done and be able to handle it in the right way. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a great story, yes. Exactly. He forgave his brothers and fed them, right? He gave them a home, right? So it's a, that's a great point. And they basically tried to kill him, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. It's understanding how to let it go. Yeah. And, and trying our best to. But yeah, it's, it, it can be hard. Yes. Oh, true. Yes. And, and obviously... I mean, I have, I have guilt, too, in, in, certain, in uh, certain sins that I've done. And, yeah, I mean, this is a struggle, like, with a lot of people, for sure. Is there anything else? All right, thank you, guys. So, as we continue to go through the self-examination, uh, there's a few more slides. Uh, and I guess the author kind of tells us, here are some ideas that you can look at, right? Here are some different, uh, I guess, things that you, you do, you may do, that you really need to try to touch on and try to repent from. And the first is the use of our tongue as a weapon. And in James 3, 5 through 6, uh, James writes, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And then skipping down to verse 8, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So I wanted to ask, why does James, and it's kind of simple, but why does James compare our tongue to a fire? Yes. Very quickly. Right? It can get out of control. Yes. That's right. Unfortunately. Exactly. And it's something... It's something that needs to be tamed, right? That's, I, think, I didn't read about that in, in, in James, but if you go back to James 3 and you read more about it, it's definitely something that needs to, you need to teach yourself how to use it and how to tame it appropriately. Um, but some of the ideas that the book kind of tells us about that we need to try to tame our tongue are one being reckless words. Uh, in Proverbs 12:18. It says, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. And uh, basically for this discretion, right? We need to learn how to have discretion in our lives. We need to be able to think. I, I heard it a lot as a kid, right? We hear it a lot as parents to kids. You need to think before you speak, basically. Uh, the second being grumbling and complaining uh, in Philippians 2.14 do everything without grumbling or arguing. It's, it's a basic command uh, that we need to apply. Uh, falsehood. 
This idea includes any form of misrepresentation or deceit, lying, um, little white lies. In Proverbs 24, 28, be not a witness against your neighbor without cause and do not deceive with your lips. Gossiping is a difficult one for many people. Um, and this is a, a sinful form of speech that can often not only spark conflict, but also fuel conflict. Uh, in Proverbs 26, 20, it says, Without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, a quarrel dies down. Um, gossiping, basically, again, we all know, uh, is a way to betray confidence in others, uh, to discuss unfavorable things or facts uh, of another person to someone who may not be a part of the conflict or just of whatever that person has done. And we always need to remember uh, that even if this information might be true about the other person, if you're talking about another person to someone else, it's gossip, and it, it's definitely sinful. Uh, slandering, uh, in Leviticus 19.16, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. neighbor. And then finally, worthless talk. In Matthew 12, 36 through 37, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Uh, very scary um, uh, teaching here from Jesus, but definitely something that we always must keep in mind as we do our best to try to tame our tongue. Uh, and again, as we consider these sinful words and these uh, actions that we might do, we need to remember that not only by doing this stuff are we, you know, sinning against God, but in essence, we're eroding our own character, right? And this is something I think I might, yeah. So we want to do our best to try to not stir up conflict, not doing this, the, these actions and, and saying these things. Because at the end of the day, we want to be able to go to God, like, you know, like it says in Matthew 12, um, and have account for what we've done and what we've said so that we can keep our relationship with God uh, healthy. Yes? Mm-hmm. It hurt. Mm-hmm. There will always be a scar, and, and that's a great point. I mean, we, again, just like reckless words, we need to really think through what we're about to say to, in any sort of conversation so that we don't say anything that does hurt or scar the other person. Yes? I would say, I would say, I, I mean, I would say yes. I mean, obviously, God is the ultimate judger. So if someone does wrong or sins or says things that are hurtful and we don't see punishment in their life, at the end of the day, at, at, at the time of judgment, they will be punished, right? So we don't need to, we don't, and, and really in our mind, if someone's hurting us and saying these awful, terrible things to us, we shouldn't be in our mind saying, man, I really hope God punishes them somehow, right? 
we should do our best to try to talk to that other person and try to come to some sort of resolution rather than trying to, you know, have them get theirs, right? I mean, we don't want to be held in sin for that type of, those types of thoughts. Mm-hmm. I can't say that that was something that God or, or something that she got because of what she's done or said, but obviously we can only do what's best for us and, and help the other person see their actions, and, and that's, that's, that's basically all we can do, unfortunately. And then hopefully pray, obviously, pray for them to uh, find some sort of peace and, and really find a way to, to stop doing their their sinful uh, speech of what, of what they're doing. Yeah, I'm. I don't. I don't think I can either. And and I, we we will probably never know. But you know, ultimately, we can only do what we can do, right? Is there any other comments to that, or any other comments at all? All right. So the next part of examining ourselves is kind of understanding whether or not we control others. Um, there are two different, I guess, uh, principles that we can look at to understand whether we do. And the first is, uh, are, we, are we trying to control others, I guess, to self-serve our own purposes, and to maximize our personal profit? Or two, are we trying to persuade or manipulate to make our life more comfortable? Uh, I think one good point when it comes to understanding this, and I'm not trying to say that this is at all good because it is not, but it is okay to at least offer advice to people, not, not to try to control people, but at least try to maybe offer advice. And now obviously offering advice can become annoying, so I, I wanted to ask if, if we do offer good advice to someone, anyone, and they don't use it, what could happen, or, or what should we do in those circumstances? Do what? Walk away. Tell them what it is, and then if they don't decide not to do it, we should respect their decision, right? I think about, I think about in this kind of uh, aspect, what God sees us, right? God's given us a Bible. He's given us his word. He's given us everything we need to uh, get through life, and yet... We may not follow it every time, right? We have all this good advice, but really it's whether or not we're going to apply it. Uh, and we too, like God does with us, we too need to understand that not everyone is going to do what we want them to do or what we think is best. And we have to be okay with that. Uh, the next item that we need to look at is breaking our word. Uh, as a Christian, God expects us to keep our word. Even when we uh, may have made a, a promise that is unwise or a commitment that's unwise, or if things don't turn out the way we thought, um, it's still a commitment. So I wanted to ask, are there circumstances when we can get out of a commitment? There are. There are. Yes, that wasn't supposed to be like, a, there are. There's, yes, you're right. There is. Right? And what are those circumstances? Do you have any examples to that? Obviously, one example is if the other person may not follow through on the commitment, right? If, if you following through and the other person doesn't, I would say that that commitment has been broken. Yeah, Mary. Yes. Exactly. 
just like uh, the parables that Jesus teaches us, right? I mean, if we ask to be let go of a commitment and they say yes, then great, you know, obviously. And if it's a commitment that may have been unwise for us to make in the first place, but obviously if they say no, we need to do our best to follow through uh, with those commitments. The next is failing to respect authority. So we know that all authority has been established by God, um, and the authority that was established was in place. We're needing, we need to be peacemakers. They were established to maintain peace and to be peacemakers. And this authority is found in the church, in our government, in our family, our workplace, and even in school for some people. Um, and verses that go along with authority can be found in Romans 13, 2, which says, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resist what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. And then uh, Matthew 23, 1 through 3, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, Sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, uh, but not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. So obviously, even if our government may do things that we don't see, I guess, I don't want to say right, but they do things that we don't agree with. Uh, if, we, if they don't cause us to sin, we still have to abide by those rules, unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I guess, and however you want to look at it. Before I move on, is there any, with these last two uh, examining uh, tools, is there anything that anyone wants to speak on? All right, and then I believe this is the final one, and we only have a few minutes, but ah, that shouldn't have happened. So the golden rule uh, in Matthew 7, 12, Jesus talks to us or, or teaches us about the golden rule. So whatever you wish to do others to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Um, forgetting the golden rule like it says, is probably one of the most common causes of conflict. And we need to always remember that whatever we want people to do to us, we must do to them. Um, I think this chapter was really good. Uh, again, lots of information, lots of techniques, practices that we can do. We didn't even get to the seven days of confession. I would recommend highly reading at least this portion of the book, the seven days of confession, um, and, and definitely trying to apply it when it comes to trying to confess our sins and, and restore conflict with others. But I do appreciate everyone's comments. I love talking and, and hearing what you all have to say, so thank you for that. And I, I hope uh, you all got a little bit of something out of this lesson as well. So thank you guys.